Hi, thank you for joining us for our mini series on supporting your preschooler and school agers behaviors. I'm Jamie Lassane Spears, and I'm the Family Engagement Specialist at Child Care Answers. You can check out all three of our videos on behavior supports for preschoolers and school agers on our YouTube channel. We also have plenty of other resources there as well. Part three is all about strategies that you can use at home to support your children's behavior. To start, there are definitely some factors that can contribute to feelings and behaviors. First of all, our expectations and consistency with those are important supports. Setting clear expectations at home, like we color at the table or on paper, will help our children understand what we expect of them. With consistency, they'll learn these expectations over time. I think it's important to note that we can't expect them to get it right the first time, but we also can't expect them to follow expectations that are always changing. If we let them color on different places all the time, and then we expect another day that it's only at the table, and that can get confusing for young children. So just keeping that in mind when we're setting our expectations. It's also important to teach them a little bit of flexibility when it comes to these, but over time, your child will understand your key and core expectations for your home. We also have to think about the environment. What's going on at home can impact behaviors and those feelings with behaviors. It can be as simple as the TV always on, which can be overstimulating for young children. If there is more stress at home, your child may feel that stress and react with some bigger emotions or behaviors. Because the thinking part of the brains has just not developed yet. They're gonna feel those things first before they um, are able to process that and think through their actions. You can learn more about this or feel free to go back to part two of this mini series to learn a little bit more why. When we set and limit our children's independence, then they will really try to stretch that independence in different ways. Remember from part one of the series that young children are testing those boundaries as they develop their sense of self. So if we limit their independence, they're going to push it a little bit harder than maybe they would if we give them opportunities um, in advance. Lastly, we are part of the equation. Our ability to self-regulate can impact our children's abilities to self-regulate. So remember that we have to have a calm brain in order to calm our children's brain. As we talked about, young children need expectations and consistency. One way to do this is to set clear routines. Setting expectations and flexible schedule for times like bedtime and meals will help your child practice and achieve independence with those clear expectations on how to do each step. Routines help children feel safe and establish a pride in their abilities. It is also important to be as consistent as possible with setting limits and giving consequences. Allow space for those feelings and those big emotions, but set expectations on how those feelings are expressed. You can say things like, it's okay to be angry, but you cannot throw the block. It is not safe. When you are angry, maybe you take a deep breath or squeeze a stuffed animal. This will help them learn how to manage their emotions in a different environments and with their friends. You can absolutely give positive praise for those positive behaviors and encourage the effort when they're trying to work really hard on managing those emotions and then also show affection to help them build that self-esteem. Lastly, to help children really regulate those emotions and behaviors, encourage physical activity. This can be hard in the winter months, but it's not impossible. You can do things like maybe cotton ball snowball fights or um, tossing bean bags into hula hoops inside. But the American Academy of Pediatrics does recommend at least an hour of active play for school-aged children throughout the day. So it's important to note that children store this energy and they all have it. Um, what it looks like for each child may look different. But the more positive opportunities we give them to release that energy, the more they're able to really manage emotions and behaviors that come throughout the day. At the end of the day, all behavior has meaning. Behaviors tell us that our children may have needs for safety or connection or calm that are not met, but they also might be telling us what they want. So they might want access to something to an object or to experience. I want the ball, or this is the classic idea of um, they're at the grocery store and they start crying because they want the lollipop and you said no. And so they have a big behavior because they want the lollipop. Um, so behaviors can tell us that they want something. They can also tell us that maybe there's something going on inside of their bodies, a need that's not being met. 
maybe it's too loud at home and they need some of the volume or um, our voices to be lowered. Maybe there's an itchy tag on their, on their shirt and all they need is that tag to be removed. So sometimes it's about what's going on inside of them and their needs there. Oftentimes, and I've experienced this a lot, and I'm sure you have too, they are seeking attention from adults and friends. Maybe they're running around the house uh, because they want to spend time with you and they don't know how else to get your attention. So they're gonna act out to say, hey mom, hey dad, hey grandma, hey grandpa, look at me. So they're gonna try to get your attention in that way. Or maybe they want to escape or avoid a situation. Um, I think this a classic example is throwing food on the floor because they're not going to try that broccoli. Um, but also it could be escape. Like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to sit down and listen to the story right now. So I'm going to run away or I'm going to scream because that's going to get me out of this situation. I want you to take a moment and think of a behavior that has happened this week. Maybe your child was dumping Legos all over the floor while you were doing the dishes. Could they have wanted you to play and needed your attention? So they're dumping them to kind of get you to notice. Or maybe they're looking for that one specific Lego and they desperately needed access to it in order to finish their design. Once we stop and we really take consideration into what the behavior is trying to tell us or to communicate to us, we are able to evaluate our next steps as parents. The best tool we have to support our children is ourselves. Modeling and practicing self-regulation helps our children to see and experience what they should do. Self-regulation is this ability to be able to manage your behavior and reactions to feelings and things that happen around you. When your child can label how they are feeling, it helps them gain the sense of control over their emotions and their ability to communicate with others. That is where modeling really comes in. We can step into a situation and say things like, I see that you're sad that your toy broke. But when I feel sad, I, I like a hug. I don't throw my toys. Um, sometimes I just need a hug. Would you like a hug or would you like some time by yourself? Giving them some options. It's important to teach your child that there are many ways to express our feelings that are safe and helpful um, and healthy, and they're not gonna hurt other people. So we cannot only model how to express our feelings, but we also have to step in and give some alternative solutions so that they know what works best for them. And it's kind of a learning experience for us as adults too. We start to learn what works best for them. And when we do, then we can help them learn that for themselves. And we're really validating those feelings saying, I hear you and I see you and I know that you're frustrated. Let me help and support you in this behavior and this emotion. One way to self-regulate is through breathing exercises. These really work best when we can model how to do them for the child, but then also taking those deep breaths with them is just something that helps them see that, you know, we can co-regulate, we can regulate together. And a little bit more about co-regulation was in part two of this mini series. Feel free to check that out. So taking three deep breaths is a really common way to do this, but I really enjoy this five finger breathing technique because it provides a natural visual alongside breaths. So all you do is you put your hand up like this, just like the visual shows on the screen and you take a big deep breath in and a big deep breath out. And you just keep doing that through all your fingers. And by the time you get to five, you're gonna notice that your whole body has less tension in it and you're able to maybe think a little bit more clearer. And like I said, it gives a visual for the child as they're taking those deep breaths. So we've all experienced the task of getting a child ready and out the door in the morning. Transitions are hard. They can be very hard when maybe we're tired, maybe we're hungry, maybe we just don't want to. Um, I know plenty of children can just say, no, no thanks, I don't wanna to go today, um, which is all developmentally appropriate. So giving trans transition warnings really help children find a chance to get to a good stopping place. Oftentimes as adults, I think we make the mistake of not communicating our next steps to our children. We may see them playing while you're putting together the lunches and getting everything ready. And you think to yourself, I'm not gonna rock the boat. I'm just gonna continue to get ready because they're doing well. But we need them to be on our page. And when it's time for them to get on our page, they're just not ready because we didn't give them the opportunity. We haven't told them where we are and where they should be. 
So without saying we are putting on our shoes in five minutes, so it's time in three minutes to get on our shoes. And then at one minute, giving them that warning. Um, hint, you don't have to make it literally five minutes, three minutes and one minute. Oftentimes I'll just say minutes uh, and it's being shorter and shorter and closer to the time um, because I lose track of time at myself sometimes. Um, but as long as you're giving them those warnings and giving them those warnings before you transition, um, it gives them this chance to find a good stopping point. Using tools like Alexa or a visual timer can help with this process as well. I wanna to end today with the best words of wisdom I have heard as a parent and as an educator. Pick your battles and I give you permission to pick your battles. I don't know if you need that, but sometimes you just need to hear it. When our children hear no and stop all the time, multiple times a day, they can easily get frustrated, but then they could start to ignore those directions as well. So when we are deciding on what behaviors to focus on, ask yourself these questions kind of as a guiding post. Will this hurt them or someone else? Will this cause damage to property um, or to something in our home? Does this go against our family's values, beliefs, or rules? And that's between you and your family and what that looks like. And then do we have to move on to something else? Is it time to make that transition? Is it time for bedtime? Is it time to leave the house? If the answer is no to all of these, it is likely a behavior you can just redirect or ignore. Obviously, you're going to make a choice based off, again, your family's rules and values and beliefs. But sometimes I have to make the decision to say, it's okay that she's wearing those shoes because she put her shoes on and they work. They might not match and they might not, it might not be raining outside and they're rain boots, but that's okay because they're going to work for the day. They're not going to harm her. They're not going to cause any damage to anyone else. Um, and we have to move on and she has her shoes on. So it doesn't have to, I don't have to hyper-focus on certain things. Um, so I think that helps just give us some tools to be able to step in to help behaviors that are really critical and helping them learn behaviors that are really important at that time. So that's all we have for today, short, concise little tools, um, please try all of these because this is the foundation to um, really supporting your children's behaviors at home. But if you're looking for more tools to put in your toolbox, something more detailed, maybe you're looking for how to make a visual support to help a routine at home, or maybe you want to learn more about how you can encourage your child's independence, we have those resources on our YouTube channel. So uh, subscribe to Child Care Answers channel on YouTube, or you can like us on Facebook. We often post a lot of this information on Facebook as well in our other social media outlets. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I look forward to learning alongside you uh, on our YouTube channel.